Welcome to BreezeLine, where you'll say, ta-ta, T-Mobile, because we have 99.9% network reliability, and they don't. That's right. Time, weather, or even streaming in a basement won't affect our superior service. That's because we have real internet, backed by our fiber-powered network. And T-Mobile? Well, they just have a 5G cellular network. So for a limited time, find your perfect speed with prices starting at $19.99 a month for 24 months. Terms and conditions apply. Go to BreezeLine.com to learn more. You are now tuned in to the Prescription for Purpose podcast, the number one podcast for Christian women to learn how to apply God's principles to fulfill your God-ordained purpose. Every episode will empower you with the tools and wisdom necessary so you can strategically execute and excel in every area of your life. This is the place for you to learn how to walk in purpose, to walk with purpose, and to fulfill God's purpose. Hey sis, have you downloaded the Prescription for Purpose mobile app? It is the number one resource for women of faith who are looking to build their faith and walk in purpose. This is not your ordinary app. There are so many great features from Bible studies to devotionals, practical resources, study tools, and flashcards for every verse in the Bible so you can truly study God's word. You can even get your own devotionals, prayers, and Bible studies featured right on the app to share with everyone in the community. My favorite part of the app is the community. There's so many women who are a part of this app that are truly just in love with God and we want to build a life that is pleasing to him. So if you are looking to partner with us to pursue your purpose, head over to the Apple App Store or to the Google Play App Store and download the Prescription for Purpose app today for free. That's RX for Purpose. Hey guys, and welcome to this week's episode of the Prescription for Purpose podcast. I'm super excited because we are continuing with the fire interviews all month long. This week, we are starting our interview with Raven Hoquette, and it's entitled How to Live Supernaturally Paid. This conversation is so necessary when we talk about being believers and being women of faith in regards to our finances. I promise y'all, we talk about all of the things, and it is just so amazing to hear how God provides in every situation. So I just pray that y'all enjoy part one of this interview. It is super dope. Make sure you follow Raven on everything. Check out her podcast, Supernaturally Paid, on your favorite streaming platform. And go and check her out on Instagram. Do all of the things because she gave, okay, in this interview. So without further ado, let's hop right into it. Hey guys, and welcome to another episode of the Prescription for Purpose podcast. I'm super excited for today's episode. We have one of my favorite people here, okay? This is my cousin in okay. In the heavens. <laughs> this is my cousin, okay? Like, this is my cousin. Um, and her name is Raven Hoquette. She is the host of the Supernaturally Paid podcast. Y'all, Raven do all the things. Okay, she designs luxury handbags. She teaches moms how to make passive income so they can be moms and still live fruitful lives. And she's a whole wife and a mom. She was just telling me that she has a program where she um, is every single day, y'all teaching the word of God. It, it's it's giving, she's in her bag and in her purpose. That's all I'm saying. So I'm so happy to have you here, Raven. I am just so excited because I know this is about to be fire. Okay. I know it's about to be fire. So can you introduce yourself to the people? And then I'm ready because this, this is about to be good. We talking about money. So <laughs> Well, I'm not going to be long because I know that this is getting ready to be a fire podcast episode, but I'm just, I'm so excited to be here. Um, Like Dr. Sharla said, I'm doing all the things because God is calling me to do all the things. Um, But I, I always get excited to talk about the subjects of money because I feel like people just really overcomplicate money and having it and what to do with it and all these other things. But if you just like surrender your money to God, like that's the biggest message that I really want to get out to the world. If you just surrender your finances over to God, he will bless you astronomically. So I'm excited to just kind of get into that on the podcast as I share my story. And 
I'm excited to share it from really a place of all angles financially. You know, I've been at a place where I didn't have any money. I've been at a place where I had money, but it felt like it was just enough to barely get by. And then I've been at places where I've had a ton of money and then didn't have a ton of money, you know? So it's, it's just a lot of different places, I guess, in the journey that I've been financially. So I feel like I understand the person that's listening to this and is feeling like, when am I going to get my big break? And then I also understand the person that's listening, listening to this and maybe you're at multi six figures or seven figures plus, and you're just trying to make sure that you're able to hold on to it all. So that's a little bit, mm -hmm. I guess, about my experience. Um, what I actually do, like Charlotte said, is all the things. I have a luxury handbag company, which has always been a dream of mine. So I'm so grateful that it's something that God has enabled me to do. My company is called Andi. I have a ministry called Supernaturally Paid, where we basically help people overcome their anxiety with money and their stress with money. And we teach them how to really fully trust God with their finances. Of course, Supernaturally Paid is a podcast. It's an event. Um, it's also different stationary resources for Christian entrepreneurs. We have planners. We have something called the pay box. Um, so it's it's literally a, a ton of things that God is having me do with this ministry. It's giving mogul. It's giving <laughs> icon. That's all I was. I'm just like, girl, yes, Lord, you better use this. Thank you. <laughs> So what does it mean for the person who doesn't know what it means? What does it mean to be supernaturally paid? Like when we when we hear that, um, especially because let me tell y'all one thing about me and Raven, we don't play this new age stuff. OK, no, we, we do not know. So what does it mean to be supernaturally paid? Yeah. So, I mean, it's really very simple. When you say that you're supernaturally paid, you are literally saying that it is God who increases me. It's God who provides for me. It's God who blesses me financially. And you're also saying that you trust God completely with your money. So I always love to use the example and say, if, if I have $10 million that's sitting in my bank account right now, and God tells me to go and buy a building for $9.9 .9 million, the average person is going to look at that like, hold on, that's all my money. That's all the money that I've been working so hard to get. But for me, because I'm supernaturally paid, I trust everything that God tells me to do with my money. I don't flinch if God tells me to invest in a coaching program that's $25,000 and pay it in full. I don't flinch if he tells me to buy an investment property in a city that I've never been to. I don't flinch if my husband comes to me and says, babe, God told me to do this, you know, with the money. And it's something that seems crazy to me. Like I trust that because God pays me because I'm supernaturally paid that he literally has my very best interest financially. So I think what I want people to understand is that being supernaturally paid is not just a statement and something you say, it is very much an action. Like your actions prove that you're supernaturally paid. I'm tithing constantly proving that I'm supernaturally paid. I'm sowing constantly proving that I'm supernaturally paid. I'm making the moves that God tells me to make, showing him, listen, I know that you're going to pay this. I know that you got this covered. I know that you're going to make a way for me. That's what that means. I love that. And I love too, because a lot of times there's sometimes in our Christian culture where we love to talk, like we love to quote the, the word, but we don't like to do the work. Yep. And one thing that I feel like I, in our rebranding, in our focus here is like, no, obedient strategic execution is what you have to have. Like mm -hmm. God can give you the word, but if you don't go out and do the stuff, then you are wasting everybody's time. And then we will shift blame to God and our circumstances and everything else instead of just being obedient. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I found as I was preparing for our interview was that a lot of the conversation around finances is fear, like fear of losing my life savings, fear of never getting out of debt, fear of feeling like a burden. Like it was just so many fears that were listed. Um, how important is it to overcome fear in order for us to live lives that are supernaturally paid? I mean, if you allow fear with money to dictate your decisions, 
you will never experience the fullness of what God has for you. It's it's that simple. And, you know, I know people don't like to hear that because it's so straightforward. And it's just like, what you mean telling me I'm not going to experience the fullness? But the Bible tells us that God has not given us the spirit of fear. And I think sometimes we look at that things like that or we look at that scripture and we think that that only applies to things like I'm not scared of heights. Or, you know, I'm not scared of water and to go to learn how to swim or I'm not, you know, we think about these things that typically a lot of people are are afraid of. But I think that money is something that so many people have a fear with, but we mask it with other things. We mask it with saying that it's financial literacy. And don't get me wrong. Financial literacy is a real thing um, and it's important. Right. But I think that when you are a slave to your budget. When your budget has become an idol, when your budget is above what God tells you to do, when you if, if you have budgeted five thousand dollars, you know, for to save this month or something like that. And then God comes to you and says, I need you to invest, you know, forty five hundred dollars into this. Some of y'all wouldn't do it because you'll be like, God, that's out of my budget. God didn't ask you about your budget. That investment that he's telling you to invest it could come back to you tenfold in the next 30 days. I've seen God's hand with literally doing this. So I feel like we need to address that fear that we try to mask as, oh, I'm on a budget or, oh, mm-hmm. you know, I don't have it. I always tell people I don't live by these worldly rules um, yeah. and I don't live by these worldly rules because I serve a God that breaks the protocol for me. Yes. Um, literally just yesterday or I'm sorry, a few days ago, God told me to apply for capital. And I was like, I I don't need it, though. I don't like I was so confused, like what is going on? Like, but it was confusing because he told me to apply to a company that denied me before. And this was a a company that when they denied me, it was definitely at a time that I needed it. And I was shocked that they denied me because I'm just like, dang, like, you know, my income is cool. This is cool. Like, what's why did they deny me? But they denied me, you know, I moved on, whatever it was at the time, I don't even remember that I needed it for, you know, God made a way. So I totally forgot about it. So when he tells me to apply for this company, I'm just like, but I ask no questions. And that's how you got to be when you're really fearless mm-hmm. about that stuff. I wasn't thinking the way people would think in the world, like, but if I if I apply, they're going to run my credit. What if they deny me? That's going to be an inquiry. None of that stuff mm-hmm. crossed my mind. All that crossed my mind is my father told me to do this. So I need to be obedient and I need to do it. So I apply for the capital. They tell me that it's going to be like one to two days until I hear back. So I didn't realize that when I applied for the capital, I used um, an email address that doesn't come to my phone. So kid you not, I completely forgot about this. Like Mm -hmm. out out of mind, like because I didn't necessarily like know that I needed it for something in my mind, I'm just like, they already denied me before. Like, I don't know why God is saying to do this, but I'm going to just do it. And like, to me, it was like, I'm just doing it just so I could be obedient. And that's it. So I get a text message yesterday talking about your capital, um, your capital account. So I was like, what is, what? Like what account? Like, so I'm thinking I'm being scammed or something. So I'm like, I'm not going to click this link. Like I'm not about to do nothing. So I go and I log in from my laptop and I see that they approved me for capital. Not only did they approve me for capital, but they approved me for capital six times the amount that I asked for. Like, I mean, excuse me, only God can break that type of protocol. This is a company, like I said, don't miss this, that denied me before. Like, and not just denied me before, like denied me like less than a year ago, like a recent denial, right? But c- came through and approved me and approved me for this amount that I'm just like, what? And now I'm looking back on it. And I'm like, dang, I told God that it was something that I needed to do. It was funds that I needed for something. And he literally provided for me in this particular way. So you have to move when God says to move. That's absolutely what it means when you are being fearless. So in a lot of what you've been saying and what I've been hearing is that you don't second guess and you don't have any, like it's this willingness to be obedient above all else, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel like that comes from you knowing and having a personal relationship with God. Like you know that because 
God is who he is in your mm-hmm. life, that you will never know any lack. And I think that a lot of times our fear and the fear that we have, even as people who say that they're believers, we mm-hmm. struggle because we don't really know God and his word. How important is it for us to have that relationship when it comes to um, our money? Mm-hmm. I mean, I always tell people the very first step to being supernaturally paid is you have to know what the Bible says about money. And that's important because if you don't know what the Bible says about money, it's going to be very hard to believe that God can exceed the expectations that you have regarding money. I believe that because I know what Ephesians says in 310. You know, I know for a fact and believe that God will supply all of my needs because I know what it says in Philippians 4. So it starts there. You know, when you don't have that foundation, when you're not filling yourself up and feasting on the word, that leaves room for the enemy to come in and tell you all type of lies. You know, when you imagine not knowing something like, let's say if, I'm going to use a recipe, for example. Let's say it's something that you've just never made before. You have maybe you never even tasted it. You don't know anything about this particular dish. If I come to you and I say, sis, this is how you make this dish. You're going to believe me and listen to me and make it like that because you just don't even know what to go off of. Whereas, though, yeah. if you didn't had an auntie that made this before, a grandma that made this before, and you you have some sort of, like, knowledge of it, you're going to be like, hold on, like, mayonnaise don't go in macaroni and cheese. Wait a minute. Like, this don't go like this. Like, you're going to know, you know, to yeah. say these things. And it's important to have that foundation because when the enemy tries to whisper lies in your ear, which he will, you will know yeah. how to fight back and say, this is a lie. Because that's not what it says in Jeremiah 29, 11. That's not what it says in Ephesians 3, 10. That's not what it says in Philippians 4 and 19. That's not what it says in all these different places in the Bible. So, I mean, that's really the foundation of it. And then I think also, like, you have to have, like, just this boldness in the way that you trust God. (laughs) Like, God, I know you're not about to play about me. And I know you don't play about me because you said in your word that, you don't even sleep when it comes to me. But imagine yeah. somebody that don't know that word, that ain't never been in, in Psalms 121. And we are too comfortable with tattooing scriptures on ourselves and it, putting it real cute at the end of a caption. Like, this is why you don't need to just read the Bible. You need to just, stu- you need to study it. Like when I'm studying the word of God and it's so powerful because sometimes like what it means to me, like that particular scripture could be totally different depending on what I'm going through in my life. You know, Ephesians 3.10 might not mean the same thing to me when I'm making seven figures that it meant to me when I didn't have no money, you know? So it's like really going through all the different motions to to study the Bible, repeating it to yourself, reading it, and then sitting in silence to see what God wants to tell you about it. Like really just like letting the scriptures marinate, writing them down, putting them on cards so that if you are like out and about during the day and the devil is trying to attack you about your finances, you can pull out that card with that scripture on it and remind yourself, you know, it's it's extremely important that we do that. I love that. And I love that you talk about um, the importance of not just reading, but studying. And I'm so grateful because I feel like this is a point that I say 50 million 11 times on this show is that biblical illiteracy is killing us as believers in every aspect because Mm -hmm. in Hosea 4 and 6 when it talks about my people perish for lack of knowledge doesn't necessarily mean that we don't know things because we can quote these scriptures but there was a translation I think it's the NLT that says my people perish because they don't know me. Mm-hmm. And then there's a level of personal experience that we have and that we have to have with God in order for us to have this level of confidence. Mm-hmm. And even as you were speaking about the um, about us having a boldness in our faith, it reminded me of, in James 1 where it talks about that when you ask God for wisdom, he'll give it to you without rebuke. But your faith has to be in him alone. Yeah. If you're placing your faith somewhere else, you are double minded and you will get nothing. I mean, mm-hmm. he said what he said. Yeah. Right. And so I think I love that you brought that up. And I love that you brought up studying scripture. And I think it's important, too, that we talk about biblical accuracy. Right. Mm -hmm. Like we talk about like rightly dividing the word and reading it for yourself, because one scripture 
that people love to bring up when we talk about finances is First Timothy 6 and 10. And so people will try to shame people of faith and say that like we shouldn't work, we shouldn't be um, talking about or having a conversation about money. Mm-hmm. But the Bible does not say that money is the root of exactly. all evil. <laughs> it says the love of money is the root of all evil. Okay. Can you touch on that a little bit? I mean... You taking me to church with this one because I love talking about that because people love to say that, you know, and for mm-hmm. a lot of us, um, depending on how we grew up, that was something that was kind of said to us as children. I know it was said to me as a child, like, mm-hmm. oh, people that make a certain amount of money, they they're devil worshipers and they do this and, you know, money brings evil. And so for me growing up, it was just like, dang, like people saying that money brings evil, but. I'm looking at us not really having a lot of money. I'm looking at the evil around me when I see drug addicts walk up and down the street and see the environment. Like Mm -hmm. I'm seeing what I'm lacking because of what we don't have, you know, financially. So I had to study it for myself. And that's why, like, I mean, no shade to the people that, oh, I'm living off my grandmother's prayers. I don't do that. And I don't do that. And I have praying grandmothers. Okay. Yeah. My, my grandmother that's still here will at 96 years old will, will pray down. But I can't, I want to know God for myself. Yeah. Not know God and know what the word says through what my grandmother said, what my mother said, my sister mm-hmm. said, my brother said, my uncle said. Like, no, I want to know the word of God for myself so that I can see how it applies to my life. And I think yeah. it's just it's too many people taking what other people say. And yeah. saying that this is what the Bible says. And it was not it was not until I really started to open up my Bible and study it that I realized that it didn't actually say money is the root of all. Like, I didn't yeah. even know that until my 20s. So imagine if you walking around for 20 years saying that money is the root of all evil because you don't know that the scripture says the love of money, you yeah. know, is the root of all evil. And I think that we got to really make sure that we're in line Mm-hmm. when it comes to that scripture because a lot of us have made success be an idol um yes. and I feel like I can say that from experience because that was something that I was doing years ago unknowingly before yeah. I was saved constantly chasing the next big accomplishment but never opening up my bible never you know studying never like doing the things that I knew that God wanted me to do like yeah. you make success an idol when you put it above God you're making yes. success an idol when you're willing to dabble in witchcraft and all these new age things that so mm-hmm. many people are willing to do, you, I can tell you right now, if you wake up and you talk to money before you talk to God, waking up talking about how your money flows to you and all of this and that, you have made money an idol because it is that important to you that it is the first thing that's on your mind when you wake up in the morning. And I think that, you know, we got to check this because we are really in sin When we do that, you know, the scripture tells us that God is a jealous God. It also tells us that we cannot serve two masters. So imagine if money is out here dictating your life, telling you what to do, dictating all of your decisions and, you know, things like that. Like it will get you in some stuff. I mean, I don't know about y'all, but I didn't been in some scenarios that I should not have been in. And it's been solely out of the love of money, investing in things that. I'm invested in it because it's saying that it's going to make me a lot of money, but I'm not looking to God to see what he thinks about this. All I'm thinking about is what this can make me. So I need to hurry up and I need to do this. Being friends with people that you know is not good people, but you're friends with them because of the amount of money that they make or being in relationships. I'm going to go there, ladies. Being in relationship with a guy that you're in this relationship with him because he made this amount of money, but God then showed you a flag greater than the devil. Like, come on, come you on. trying to call it the blood of Jesus? <laughs> come on, come on. Oh, is it the blood? No, baby, it's a red flag. <laughs> it's like you already know that this is wrong, but your love of money has you in such a chokehold that money dictates every single decision that you make. You know, yeah. I remember going through a tough time uh, financially. And it was odd because God had told me to shut down my coaching business. So I'm just Mm -hmm. like, what? But you told me to do, you know, it's, I could still be over here making this money, but it's kind of tight because this is what you told me, you know, to do. And I remember being in that season and feeling like, excuse me, like who, what? Like, 
how did I get here? You know, what's going on? And it was a tough time all around because we had just moved to Dallas. So not only did God tell me to shut down my business, my husband's kind of was just like, had to shut it down because he had an in-person business. So yeah. we had just relocated to, you know, halfway across the country. So shut down the businesses, things are really tight. And I remember one night my husband said to me, like, you know, what if God has taken us through this Job season just to see how we going to act, just to see if we're going to complain every day, just to see if every day we're going to be like, dang, God, how come you ain't do this for me yet? Or what's going on with this? And it really hit me like that. I've been complaining about this every day. Like mm -hmm. I've been extra emotional about this every day. Yeah. But what if God is doing this to show me how to put him first? What yeah. if he's doing this to, to see if God is still going to be good, you know, to me mm -hmm. with the finances? And I always say that, like, it's easy for people to get on stages when they're making all this money and talk about, I'm blessed, I'm this, I'm that. It's been times that God has called me to do things and I am flat out upset because it's like, God, you want me to come and pray for these people and I need somebody to pray for me. You want me to, mm -hmm. to lay hands on people and I need somebody to lay hands on me. But that's when you know that it is above money. You know, it's not about like, I was just telling people at my Supernaturally Paid conference. That's probably like the seventh conference that I've done across the board. Like I've been doing um, events since like 2013, but like big multi-day conferences, I've been doing those since 2016. And let me just tell y'all, if you've never had a conference before, it costs a lot of money. I'm just mm -hmm. telling you that. Like, I mean, it'd be very much given five figures unless you having it in somebody's alley or something like that. But if you're talking about hotels and minimums and room blocks, all of that stuff costs a pretty penny. Yeah. So when he told me to do this supernaturally paid conference that I did this past December, I didn't want to do it. I'm going to tell y'all. And I didn't want to do it because I felt like me and my family is good financially. I'm not finna start this conference stuff again. Like I'm not about to go to my husband and be like, babe, I got to put 10,000 into this. And are you okay with it? Like, I'm not trying to do that. We over here living good, minding our business. People, computers work very great. Can we just do this virtually? Like, what's up? I did not want to do it. Then when God said do it in December, excuse me, you want oh, me to day time. when it's like not the peak conference time, you want me to do it right before the holidays. Like nobody is going to show up to this. This is all what the enemy is trying to put in my mind, trying to tell me that basically, you know, nobody is getting ready to show up for this conference. So it was hard, but that was the very first conference I've ever had that's been profitable. So this is almost seven years of doing something and you're just seeing a profit. Now, mm -hmm. granted, my past conferences have been profitable way on the back end where people are signed up for stuff and all of that. But on the front end, uh, -uh. like you ain't getting a profit until days later, weeks later. You got to front that 10,000. I've had conferences that have cost me twenty eight thousand dollars out of pocket. Like I'm talking about expensive, expensive. Yeah. And imagine me saying, God, I'm not going to do this because of the money. I'm not going to do this because of no, like God wants to really see, do you trust me? Do you believe that I will provide for you? Because in the midst of not making money off of those conferences, my lights was never turned off. Yeah. The, it was always a roof that was over my head. And I didn't told y'all I started these conferences in 2016. This is before I was married. So this was when just my income, you know, I, I don't have no husband to be like, I don't got it. <laughs> Do you got it? I can't like, no, it's like God was sustaining me this entire time, mm -hmm. you know? So I think that you got to ask yourself, especially when you say, I want to be supernaturally paid. I aspire to think that way about money. Don't forget to ask yourself, am I really willing to basically bet it all on God? Because that's mm -hmm. what you have to do. I love that. There's so much that I want to unpack. Even when you were talking about um, with the love of money, investing in things that mm -hmm. look like they're going to be profitable. Do you remember this pandemic that we had of people doing the susus? Oh, girl, I got so <laughs> many calls about that. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm like yeah, this don't even make this. The math ain't math ain't. The math isn't math ain't. And so when you, when we live, for the love of money, we will do things that we know don't make no good sense. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
Like, like, you know, that is gonna make no good sense. <laughs> like, you no, know it don't make sense. And we know that it's not something that God wants us to do. Yeah, We are so easily influenced when God is not con- in control, you know, of our finances and we'll literally do anything out of desperation. And that's the thing, like God's word says, I don't have to be anxious for anything. I don't have to panic. I don't got to borrow against my house. I don't got to do, unless God tells me to, I don't need to do these things out of panic. And I think that we need to get in a, in a place. And this is another thing that I talk about all the time, but like some of us literally like to just look at money in our bank account. Like, let me log, let me go on here, Chase Bank, this bank, see what they got. Like, we just like to look at it sitting in our account because it just makes us feel good. But let me tell y'all, I am employed by the kingdom of God. Because I am employed by the kingdom of God, if God is giving me money, it's something that I have to do with it. Yes, sometimes that stuff is put this into our IRAs and our retirement investment accounts and put this into our son's investment. Like, yes, sometimes it's practical things like that. But there's a lot of times that it's like, oh, go and spend $10,000 on this. Go and do this. Go and hire. Like, it's things that I don't even be wanting to do. Mm -hmm. But I cannot get in this place where if I have seven figures sitting in my account, that that seven figures just starts to control me. And I'm just sitting there like, oh, let me sit, look at it. It looks pretty like, uh, think about with, I'm a, since I just talked about retirement accounts, I'm going to use an investment account as an example. If you put a thousand dollars in a brokerage account right now, and you don't do anything with it, you never take the risk to jump into any stocks, any ETFs. Guess what's going to happen when you log into that account in 10 years, 20 years, you will miss out on so much compound interest because you never made a move. You mm-hmm. will not see a true harvest, a true return on that investment until you make a move with that money and say, let me go and get this ETF. Let yeah. me go and get this stock. I'm mean, this uh, stock. Let me go and do that. Like you're not going to see anything until you basically do that. And I look at my regular accounts the same way with the money that God has given me. Okay. How are we about to flip this? What are we going to do? Like, Is it sometimes that he says, you know, just leave this there? Yes. But I listen to everything that he tells me to do financially, even if it does not make any sense to me in the moment. When I get off this call, I'm literally about to write down that amount that he just released to me with that capital and ask him to tell me exactly where that goes. And he might not tell me right now where the full amount is supposed to go. It might be like, okay, just take out a thousand and do that and put that here. Then I'm going to be waiting for whatever he wants me to do with the remaining balance. Like you have to let God instruct you. Like I'm telling you, God is the ultimate financial advisor. Like Mm -hmm. seriously, like, I mean, seriously, like God knows all of that stuff. Like I also want to recommend a book to you guys. It's called Supernatural Finances. Um, I think the author is like Kevin, uh, I cannot pronounce his last name. I think it's the die, but he has a powerful story in there about how he had all this money invested into the stock market. Like most people do. And out of nowhere, this lady appeared like this is a real story in this book. I'm telling y'all this lady appeared and told him God wants him to take all his money out of the stock market. So he said he looked back like two seconds later, nobody was there. Like he was like, what? Like who? Like what is going on? But he listened. He was obedient and took his money out. He took his money out before one of the biggest market crashes ever. Like literally lost nothing because he was obedient and took his money out because God said to take his money, take the money out of the account. He has a, well, I ain't, ain't going to tell the other story because it's too good. I'm going to just tell y'all, go, go ahead and, you know, get the get book. The book. But, You know, when you see God's hand like that in other people's lives and other people's finances, you have no choice but to believe like, dang, like God really is something like God will really provide for me exceedingly and abundantly beyond anything that I could do for myself. And that's where we want to be with money. You know, that's how we want to think about it. 
when it comes to our finances. I love that. I have a story similar to that where my husband, he does real estate. Mm -hmm. And whenever he gets a check, um, like a commission check before he does anything with it at all, he prays about it. So mm -hmm. he literally have to check, sit down and say, like, God, I thank you for this, et cetera, et cetera. Like, what do you want me to do with this money? Mm -hmm. And he had a he had a closing last year. He got this money. And he prayed, and I was like, well, what did I say? He was like, he just told me to hold on to it. Mm. Literally the next week, our air conditioner went out. Mm. And we were able to get a whole new AC units. We live in Florida, so we have two AC units. AC units completely redone, and it did not negatively impact our savings or anything else. Mm. God just was like, hold still. <laughs> Because mm. he always knows what's around the corner. And that's yes. what we need to understand. Like, you don't need to be worried about tomorrow when you serve a God that already knows every single thing down to the minute, down to the dollar that's going to happen tomorrow. Like, you don't need to be concerned about that. I yeah. will never forget when God told me to get my very first apartment. Um, This was 2012, so over 10 years ago. And this was at a time that I felt like I'm good in my mother's house. I'm cool. Like it ain't like overwhelming. Like it ain't one of these houses where it's like you, you have a curfew, even though, you know, you're in your twenties. Like I felt like I was good, but God has specifically told me in like 2011, this was Christmas time. He said this time next year, you're not going to be living here. And when my mother asked me what I wanted for Christmas, I was like pots and pans. And she was like, girl, I got pots. What you trying to say? And I'm like, I ain't going to be living here this time next year. So I need pots and pans. So she bought me some pots and pans for Christmas. And I remember as the next year was, you know, going through the motions when it was about June, I'm looking at my money like <clears throat> it ain't giving apartment. It ain't giving, you know, it's move out time. It's definitely not giving. So I asked one of my friends to move in with me. Like, could we be roommates? Because, you know, we can split the expenses. So she ends up moving in with her twin sister. Okay, how can I be mad at that? That's your sister and that's your twin sister, whatever. So then I asked my other friend like, hey, you know, let's, you know, try to get a place together. We start going, looking at places, found this one apartment that we really, really loved. We were about to make a move on it. And her boyfriend asked her to move in with him. I definitely can't compete with no pillow talk, okay? Come so on. now I'm on this island all on my own. So God said, I said, you get an apartment. I didn't say somebody else. I didn't say get a roommate. So I'm just like, but God, I don't have this money. Mind you, at this time in 2012, I had been less than a year self-employed. So I was enjoying my business. I was enjoying life, but it definitely was not profitable at all, you know, at that time. So I remember... When he sent me to the apartment complex, um, it was actually the apartment that I looked or looked at with my friend that ended up moving in with her boyfriend. They lived in one building and I lived in another building. So um, I went to the apartment complex to apply. And I remember I was so like without money at that time that I, did, I could not even afford the application fee. I think it was like a $35 application fee. My account was overdrawn at the time. I had to call my mother and say, Hey, can I use your card to pay this applicant? So you look crazy as I don't know what going to apply for an apartment and you don't even have the application fee. Come on. Like you, you look insane. So I go and I apply. And I remember at the time, because I wasn't making a lot of money, I didn't even have the best credit because my bills had got behind from not really making a lot of money in my business. So now this is impacting my credit score. So I submit the application. I'm inside of the leasing office. They had like this extra like room in there. So I go inside of there and I'm just praying like, God, if you make this work out, like I'm trusting that you're going to provide. I'm trusting that whenever, you know, the rent is due, I'm not going to miss a beat. Everything is going to be fine. Like I'm trusting that this, this going to be good. So she, the lady comes back in the room and says, oh, you're approved. She's like, your move-in date is October 1st. Mind you, this is like July the 19th. So at the time, it felt like, okay, I got time. I got more than two months. You know, everything is good. So I didn't sign the dotted line. I have to move into this apartment. I have to have, you know, my security deposit and all of that stuff. Like when it's time to move in, I'm making plans. I'm calling movers. I didn't took out 
um, another credit card to get financing on furniture because I don't want to live in like no empty, you know, apartment. So I literally have furniture scheduled to be delivered. I have movers like scheduled to come. It is September 25th and I still don't have the money. And I mean, don't have it like not even close. Like mm. do not have the money, like don't know, but ain't worried about a thing. <laughs> ain't worried about nothing. Best like pieces are passing all Tell him <laughs> asking people is you coming to the house warming? What's going like I'm knowing that God said that this thing is going to work. This episode is brought to you by HERS. Look, we've been talking a lot about making sure we have proper support in place. And at ForHERS.com, you can get access to real medical providers who can prescribe trusted anxiety and depression medication if it's right for you. The process is 100% online, including unlimited check-ins, provider messaging, and support along the way. Plus, to make things even simpler, girl, you can get your first month of treatment for just $25 if prescribed. To get started, go to forhers.com slash spring. That's forhers.com slash S-P-R-I-N-G. Look, I'm a healthcare provider, and I love that this makes healthcare and mental health care accessible to everyone. So you can get started today at forhers.com slash spring. That's forhers.com slash S-P-R-I-N-G. Offer available only if prescribed. Prescription products require an online consultation with a healthcare provider who will determine if a prescription is appropriate. Subscription required. Additional restrictions apply. See website for full details and important safety information. It was like September 27th. Still don't have the money now. And you know, it's only 30 days in September. So you better hurry up and get this money, sis, because you got one less day to get it before you got to move up in here. It must have been like September 29th. And when I tell you God came through with so much money that I could have paid my rent three months in advance if oh I wanted to, everything was covered. Everything was paid for. Everything, like, I mean, literally completely made a way for me out of no way. And I remember mm. when I first got in there, and this was, again, my very first apartment, so I don't even know how to handle this. You know, at the time, I'm like, believe in God, but ain't really saved, saved. So I don't know about the anointing oil. And, you know, I wasn't hit to all of that. But I go in there and I'm like, just praying over this apartment. Like, God, I'm praying that it's, it's no interruptions here. My lights are never cut off. My, my utilities are never cut off. Like, everything is fine. Everything can work for me. And... It was fine. Never evicted, never late on my rent, never any type of it's like literally God carried me through. And that was a huge example of me trusting God because people see you in the apartment, but they don't see you applying for the apartment when you don't have no money in your account. They don't mm -hmm. see you stepping out on faith and signing a lease that you don't know how you're going to pay for. See, I feel like God provides for me in a certain way because I'm not scared to sign the lease. I'm not scared to sign the contract. I'm not scared to sign off on the mortgage papers. I'm not scared to sign off on the refinancing. Like I'm always trusting him that if you have presented this opportunity for me, that you are going to make a way, that you are going to provide for me. And yeah. I think sometimes we get caught up in like, well, God don't need no help and God don't. And yeah, God does not need help. But if he told you to have a conference at a certain venue, he does need you to sign the paperwork. Yeah. To book the venue. If yeah. God told you that you're supposed to get this car, he does need you to go to the dealership. You're not just going to walk outside and a dealership. I mean, God does miracles. So maybe he might work, you know, with you that way. But I did not just walk outside and it was a certain car just sitting out there and a random stranger said, God told me to give this to you. You know, yeah. it didn't work like that. So we have to have respect for the things that God needs us to do on our part. Yeah. If you want to be supernaturally paid. Yeah. And it's a partnership, right? Like mm -hmm. if That's I say that all the time, because I went, I went to school with, um, I worked, used to work with this lady and she was like very, very saved, but was like of no earthly, like wisdom. Like mm -hmm. you just know all the scriptures, but girl, what? And so uh, she was like, I'm believing God to like increase my education. And I'm like, well, did you apply? to nursing school like did you apply and she was like no I don't really know that but if he already told you that this was what he was going to do Hello? he's not going to do the application for you right it's faith without works is dead so he can give you the the mm -hmm. instruction but if you're not obedient to the instruction and you don't execute and follow through girl and it would be out here well, god you said you was going to do this for me well you have to follow the instructions 
Like Hello. he's like, I can't. God told me to, to become a, a nurse. I did, but he was not going to. I wasn't gonna wake up and be like, oh man, I got a nursing license now. Like you have to go to school. You have to do the stuff. You have to mm-hmm. go through the process. And a lot of times, people like the promise, but we don't put no respect on the process. Mm-hmm. We want to forego that part. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times, what I find is that in the process. God will reveal bits and pieces of the purpose. So even in the story that you just shared, it's I, like, I understand why now you have a whole ministry called Supernaturally Paid because God has been demonstrating and walking you through this so you can use your testimony mm-hmm. to help other people overcome the barriers to living financially free in Christ. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. And I think that it's amazing <laughs> when we see so many people that we know are Christians And they're Christians, but they're low key kind of not believers. It's like, how can you say that you're a Christian and you're studying, you know, the word of God. But when God says, I'll provide for you, you won't make certain moves with your money because you don't believe that God will really give you that provision. You know, Mm -hmm. we have to keep in mind that it is an act. And like you said, that scripture in the book of James, that faith without the works is dead, you know. I don't just say, God, I'm believing you to do this. And then I'm sitting still. No, what, what you need me to do? Yeah. And and yes, it has been times where God is like, sit still, chill out. And he'll just do it. Like but with that funding. Right, exactly. Like with that funding, he led me to just forget, like just sit still, just mind your bit. Like I didn't follow up and email nobody. It was just like, sit still. I don't need you to do nothing. But other things, it's been like, okay, I need you to do this. I need you to contact this person. I need you to go here. Like, it's been things that made me extremely uncomfortable, but I still did it. Yes. That's simple. Yes. There's no way that we can walk this walk and remain in a relationship with comfortability. Mm-hmm. Right. Like there's no way that I can follow Christ and also be comfortable. I can have peace, but mm-hmm. peace and being having peace and being comfortable and complacent are two different things. Completely different. Yep. And so we have to really have the appropriate mindset about what it means to be a Christ follower. Cause like you said, people believe, but that don't make them a disciple and a follower and a believer of Christ. Like they, mm-hmm. they know of Christ, we claimed the title of Christian, but we're not walking and following in his word and his footsteps mm-hmm. because Jesus, Jesus had them, the disciples out here was out here doing stuff. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> when I always love, I love Bible stories. And as you were talking, it, it reminded me of the story, the two fish and the five loaves, mm-hmm. right? Like, if God God is going to provide and he's going to multiply anything we put in his hand. Yep. So he took two fish and five loaves and fed thousands upon Many thousands people. of people. <laughs> there was so much that people had leftovers. They was taking mm. to go boxes. Like, For an example of making a way out of no way. And I, I love, I struggled. We had just bought our house mm-hmm. and God had told me to to quit my little funny money job where I was teaching nursing students. It was like easy money. I I enjoyed it and it was easy money, but he told me he wanted me to go back to school to get my doctorate. Mm -hmm. And he was like, you're going to have to quit your part-time job. And I was like, but it's my, it's easy money. (laughs) I'm like, I was just moved into this house. Like it's easy money. Like, Mm -hmm. come on, Lord. Are you sure? (laughs) Yes. And that man, I got to quit today. (laughs) He said unto me, Mm. either you can be Jehovah Jireh or I can. Ooh. And I was like, to whom it may concern. <laughs> <laughs> I supernaturally go. Okay. <laughs> I regretfully fully inform you that I got to go because he has said it. Okay. Because maybe I ain't about to do this work. Uh-uh. I love it. I love it. And even the way that we got the house, right? It mm. was easy for me to be able to do that. God had told me that we were going to buy a house. And so he gave me very specific parameters. He was like, don't spend more than this amount of money. The Mm. bank is going to approve you for double that. Do not spend that. You Mm. only spend this amount of money. Mm. And I had told God what I was looking for in a home. Like, these are the desires of my heart. We live out of state. So I want a space for my family to be able to come. Mm -hmm. I wanted a pool. I wanted a house that, like, I could see us bringing our first kid home to. Like, I wanted Mm -hmm. not, like, dream, like, everything I ever wanted. But there were some things that Mm -hmm. I was like, God, this is what I'm believing you for. And, of course, my husband was my realtor. So we go see house after house after house after house. And at the time, the way that they claimed that the market was, 
we were not finding what I was looking for and what I knew God said I could have without mm. compromise. And I was like, I'm mm. not willing to compromise. And so then we ended up going to go see this house that was like closer to the to that the closer to what we got approved for. But it was a foreclosure. So I was like, okay, here's what God is about to do. He about to have me get this house for a crazy amount of money. Mm. And so I wrote the, um, we wrote an offer to the the bank. The bank was in Texas too. And we wrote the offer to the bank and they were like, nah. And I was like, oh, what happened? <laughs> like, God, what Why? happened? <laughs> but then my resolve was, I said, you know what, God, I feel like this house hunt is becoming an idol. And mm. no matter what happens, anywhere that I have, what matters most to me, which is my family, my faith, is home. So mm. if you say that we go rent for another year, like whatever, I don't even care. I'm just going to chunk it up to that. Mm-hmm. Literally on July 4th, my husband's like, yo, I think I found a house. Mm. And I'd already told him that I had fired him as my realtor because God, <laughs> I, was, I was making an idol out of this. Don't bring it to no more properties. <laughs> Okay, this is not like house hunters. You go to house after house after right, house. Right, and you just pick one Expenses. of the three. <laughs> you don't just do one through three, ding dong, and show up. My right. friend was on house hunters and told me that um, the house, they already know what house they're going to pick because they're already under contract when they go to film. Right, I heard that too. Yep, but, like you not you can't even get one there unless you're under contract. Yes, black. Anyway, um, I prayed and I said, okay, God, like, can we go see this house? Nobody is going out looking at homes on the 4th of July. Nobody. It's just not what people do, but we did. So we typed the address in. It's five minutes from our rental house. We've lived here in the in the city for like a year and a half. And we did not know that there's a whole subdivision right mm. around the corner. So we go to the drive, like we are on our way to the house and then we can't find it. Because the driveway is so long, you cannot see this house off the street. Wow. So the minute we pull up, immediately in my spirit, I Mm. said, this is it. Mm. We go in, because I told God, we were the house that was like double the price. It was in the gated community. I wanted safety and security. I wanted to have a place where I felt like I could let my kids go out front and not be fearful of their life. Right. Not that I'm going to leave my kids unattended, but just like just in a space where I know they could go out front and somebody would really have to do some work if they, right. they was going to try to come up and pull up on me and my kids, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so there were just these things that I wanted. And the fact that it's the only house in the neighborhood like this that mm. sits all, I mean, you can legitimately fit 10 cars on this driveway. Wow. And so then we walk in and it's beautiful. It needed work, but it was beautiful. Hmm. And come to find out, they were in pre-foreclosure. They had to be under contract by the end of the week. The daughter, the 18-year-old daughter was there all by herself, and she spilled all the tea. She told us everything. Wow, what a blessing. Like, and then we got the house. Hmm. And not only did we get the house, but because my husband is a realtor and the way God worked it out, they had originally had the house on the market for almost $500,000 and we got it for oh. under four. Wow. And then they had to pay us to buy the house because my husband got commission. Mm. They gave us money. They gave like seller concessions. It was just like never in my wildest dreams would I have thought it to wow. now be in a position where the market here in Tampa is outrageous oh, and we're yeah. sitting on like six figures worth of equity. Oh, I'm sure. And it makes sense because God said, don't run up, don't run up the bill mm. because there was equity attached to it. So good. And I'm like, this is wild. <laughs> like This mm. is every time I think it. So then when he told me to quit the job, I was like. I mean, look, after what you just pulled with the whole... Okay. <laughs> Who am I? What do you need me quit? What I got to do? Am I? <laughs> Who am I? And I love that you talk about how it requires our interaction. That's the beauty of being in a relationship with God mm-hmm. is that we get the ability to play a role in the miracle. We don't manifest it because mm-hmm. that's witchcraft, but we get to play a role in it. And then we get to sit back and watch God do the part that was impossible. Yep. Had my husband not still been looking at houses, had we never seen it, had we never written the contract, then we wouldn't have had the house. Yep. 
But mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we were obedient, it was beautiful. And we closed on my husband's birthday. Like, what an wow. amazing gift. God said, I got this whole plan worked out. Girl, and in the move, it was five minutes around the corner. I was like, we are not, but we are not getting movers. We will be putting all these things in our cars. Right. Taking your time with it. <laughs> and just <laughs> driving around the corner. Right. House was hiding in plain sight the whole time. Yes. I was like, that's how God will do it back here. <laughs> that is how God will do. And I love this, it. It's a whole neighborhood. One thing that I've noticed is that we, there's a, a level of what we feel is risk as humans mm -hmm. that we take when we talk about living supernaturally paid. Mm -hmm. Can you explain a little bit about what the poverty mindset is and then how you've seen that impact the people that you've worked with in the life of believers when it comes to living supernaturally paid? I think that what we don't say, because we talk a lot about the spirit of poverty, but we kind of just write it off as like, oh, spirit of poverty, like, oh, okay. But we don't understand that when you invite the spirit of poverty in, that spirit brings its cousins, which is worry, stress, mm -hmm. anxiety, scarcity, all these things. Like you don't understand you're stressed about money and it ain't about this bill. It is about the spirit of poverty. You think that that hospital bill has you stressed out? It is about the spirit of poverty. That's really the roots and the foundation of it. And I think yeah. that for us, especially as entrepreneurs um and not even just entrepreneurs but as adults you know adults yeah. whether you're in the workforce or whether you're an entrepreneur it kind of really turns into a scarcity mindset for most of us where yeah. we won't make certain moves financially because we're afraid of what could happen next you know we're yeah. afraid of how this is going to go um it, it's just it's crazy to me because at some point you got to get fed up what, what you want to do? <laughs> it's like, why do you want to keep living like this? And I know for me, I got tired because when it was just me, when I was acting like I was Jehovah Jireh, I was making money, but it it would always run out. It would mm -hmm. always seem like it wasn't enough. It would always seem like, dang, well, I could have still had this if I didn't do this. It was always a mess, like really yeah. to just say it flat out. It was always a mess. Yeah. And when I invited God in, it changed my everything. It's like, I don't, I'm not operating in scarcity anymore because I know that I serve a God that can provide for me abundantly. You know, I'm not operating in fear anymore because God already told me that I don't need to have any fear. Like mm -hmm. all these things basically were able to come into play for me because I said, no, I'm cutting this off at the root. It's yeah. no more stressing out about money. And I think people, we have to understand how costly it is to stress about money. Yeah. Stressing about money caused me to have a high-risk pregnancy. This is a real testimony. Because it caused me to have a high-risk pregnancy, this is more doctor's bills because now I have to go to the doctors more. Yeah. You know, I ended up, um, by the grace of God, like, you know, of course, my child got here safely. He got here healthy and all of that stuff. Hey, sis, I want to tell you about our new Prescription for Purpose quiz. This quiz takes less than three minutes to complete. And when you finish, you will receive your official purpose prescription. Your prescription will include information about your diagnoses. And then you get free courses to help you take the necessary steps to start walking in purpose. The quiz is customized to help you in your current season. Do not spend another day without the clarity and instruction that you need. Go right now to the link in the show notes, take the quiz and get your official purpose prescription today. Now let's get back to the show. But um, the complication that I had in my pregnancy led me to another uh, complication which impacted him. He had, well, you are, you're a doctor, so you know, like, yes. all these means. I'm about to say, I hope I'm not getting too medical for y'all, but clearly, like, medical is on the line, okay? Okay. Um, but he ended up deal having to deal with Iger, which, yeah. you know, he had the, like, literally yeah. four pounds, yeah. nine, uh, nine ounces yeah. when I had him. And, you know, sometimes when he first was born, I would look at him, and of course, I was in joy, but I would just cry with so much emotion because yeah. how differently could my pregnancy have gone had I not been stressed? And don't get me wrong, like, you know, again, still healthy, no problems, nothing. Yeah. I mean, just a little if small. you look at him today, I mean, he's still pretty like on yeah. the smaller side. 
but also he has small parents. So it's not like, you know, you wouldn't look at him and be like, dang, how big was he, you know, when you had him or anything like that. Yeah. But I felt bad because my stress literally impacted my child yes. and my stress about finances. I wasn't stressed because, oh, this is going on and this is. No, I was literally stressed because God told me to shut down this coaching business. And because I was so used to being fake, being Jehovah Jireh, catch that fake, fake being Jehovah Jireh. I mm -hmm. needed to be delivered from that and really believe that God would provide for me. And so it caused me a great deal of stress because it was like a fish out of water. Like, oh my goodness, I'm so uncomfortable yeah. and I'm trying to manage my emotions, you know, while being pregnant. So, yeah. I mean, it was hard. But I think that if you could see how you're operating in scarcity is going to impact your children because then they'll operate like that. Yeah. If you could see how your money stress and anxiety is going to cause them to operate. Like I said, I got to cut this off. I have to cut this off. I cannot pass this down to my kids because when you're around, you don't even got to be a parent to see this. When yeah. you're around kids, you know for a fact that when kids come into this world, they do not think practically. Basically, everything is off of faith. That's why we call it childlike faith. Yes. And my son says, he woke me up this morning. Mind you, we ain't had no more of his favorite muffins. Y'all know them little bites that they all like? Didn't have no more. They're delicious. He wake me up, mom, I need muffins, mama. I. He did not one time say, do you and daddy have money to get muffins? Can y'all come on. for it? Baby, he don't care nothing about what's in that bank account. When he asked to go to Chuck E. Cheese, all these different places, when he said, I want to see my cousins that live in another state, he's never concerned about what's in the bank account. He's yeah. never asking, do you have it? Every single time he's believing in faith that his parents have it. Yeah. Why am I not looking at God with that same level oh, of faith? Why am I going and checking my bank account? And I literally told my Increase 365 group about this today. I said, stop checking your account balance. Why are you yeah. pulling up at the Chick-fil-A questioning whether you got $9 to pay this meal? Like, let, let's be for real. At yeah. this, like, yeah. you think that God would have you get in his line and embarrass you? Because, baby, if you get in his line and that card declines, I guarantee you somebody's going to pay it forward. And something, something is going to happen. You have to believe that God is always able to make a way. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's life changing because it forces you to kind of get in situations that you just like, like last week at this time, I didn't even know that that capital was coming. Yeah. Now here we are a week later and I get to go to God excited, like, dang, what I got to do? But it was the faith that hit that submit button. It yeah. was the faith that said, you know what? I don't care if y'all denied me before. Yeah. My God is in the approvals business. Yeah. He can do it. My God is in the protocol breaking business. And yep. it doesn't matter what y'all saying y'all want my, my business credit paid X score to be. It doesn't matter what y'all saying y'all want my personal credit score to be. It doesn't matter what y'all saying y'all want my monthly transactions. It None of that. The rules don't apply to me. Period. Yep. Yep. And when you're supernaturally paid, you kind of start to adapt this confidence that, dang, them rules really don't apply. To, like, they yeah. really don't apply to me, though. And yeah. so that's how I operate. I never yes. I never consider could things get scarce because I serve a God of abundance. Yeah. If stuff did get funny, he's still going to make a way. Yep. Still. And, yep. and I, I know that because I'm a walking testimony. Like, this testimony is years in the making. Like, yeah. I need people to understand, like, supernaturally paid might be new to y'all as of, like, 2022. But this is a testimony that is years and years and years in the making. Like, yep. I remember growing up in the hood and in dreams. And I'm talking about as a four, five-year-old child seeing visions of me living in the house that me and my family live in now. Come and on. if y'all have not heard my story, y'all know that it's even a testimony behind that with how many days we lived in a hotel. So many people thought that we were crazy. Why are y'all living in a hotel and y'all could just go get an apartment? Y'all could just go and get a townhouse? No, but God said, mm -hmm. this, like, this is what God told us to do. Whether it makes sense to y'all or not, this is what God told us to do. And we got to yeah. be obedient. And now we're seeing a harvest from it. Come on. I love that. I absolutely love that. And I love that you talked about not only can God do it, but I think a lot of us struggle with 
believing that God will do it for us. It's very easy for me to, to encourage somebody else to say, oh, girl, God is going to do it for you and wholeheartedly believe it. But when it comes to our personal relationship with him and him doing it for us, we don't take our financial situations to God because we feel like we're being a burden or we don't trust that he loves us enough to actually do it. And so then it keeps us in this position where we are struggling and scared, but not going to the only source of our, our help. Mm -hmm. And it's so, so crazy that we give the enemy the ability to do that, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of times, one thing that God has really been showing me is that a lot of the strife that we go through is our flesh. It's not mm -hmm. even the enemy. We give yep. the enemy too much credit because the word says that he's already been defeated. Now, he's we're still in war, so he's going to exploit anything that he can. Mm -hmm. he's, and so it's really more so about us working with the Holy Spirit to mitigate the struggles of our flesh. So that way we can experience what God is telling us is available to us. So that was so, so good. Now, mm -hmm. this has been amazing. I have kind of like a two part question for you mm -hmm. to wrap it up. For the person who's struggling financially, or the person who is like the mom, the wife, and we have multiple roles to fill. Mm -hmm. What practical steps would you give each one of those people in terms of starting to change their financial situation for the person who's struggling and for the, the women who have multi titles and serve in multi roles? How do we live well without becoming a slave to money. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to first speak to the person that is in a struggling financial situation. Um, because it's, I'm going to be honest, it's hard when you feel like you are in a rut that you just cannot get out of. Mm -hmm. Like it is hard. One of the first things that I had to do when I felt like I was just in a financial situation that was not going to change or didn't seem like it was giving would start to turn up praise and worship music so loud, like so loud, like literally serving all of hell notice. Stop playing with me. Stop coming in this house and trying to get up in my thoughts. Stop, you know, because the thing about good praise and worship music is uplifting. So, you know, that's something that when you feel like you're in a rut that you just can't get out of, like uplift yourself first, like turn on that praise and worship music that's telling you everything is going to be okay and then open up your Bible because it's going to back it up. It's going to back it up when you go into James 1 and you learn that it, it says the trials produces endurance, you know, for us. It's, it's important. Like you think that that season that you're going through is pointless and why has thou forsaken me and all these things that we like to say, but you don't know that you're going to need that. You know, when you get to that next season, you're going to be grateful for the lessons of your last season. You're going to be grateful for every single thing that you were taken through. So I think that you have to first um, understand those things. And then also like ask God for the strategy, because sometimes we're in financial situations that we don't have to be in. It's just that the strategy that God has given us, it doesn't make sense to us. So we let that fear come in like, well, dang, my finance is already weird, but you're telling me to leave my job or this is going on and you telling me to do this. Like ask God for the strategy and actually obey, actually listen, actually say like, I'm really going to try something different this time and see what can happen when I really let you basically show me your hand. Like that's extremely important. And then for the person that has multiple roles, the one that's the, the wife, the mama, the the employee, the entrepreneur, whatever you are, you're all these different things. Like what I want you to do is flip the script. That's what I had to do when I had my son, because I didn't even realize when I had him, the spirit of poverty tried to creep back in through like scarcity that was disguised as tr trying to basically make sure that he had provision. It had like, it was almost like with my husband, it had the opposite effect. It was like, he became more risky because we had a child, it became like, I got to do this. I got my kid. I got this. Like, I have to do this. But for me, it was like, uh, like, you know, <laughs> can't be getting evicted with a child. Like, just it was like a scarcity type of thing. And then I thought to myself, how would my son feel if he grew up and knew that I didn't risk it all for him? 
that I didn't trust God for him, that I didn't do and be obedient to everything that God told me to do so that he could live a better life. Because this is the thing. My son is reaping the harvest of the fearlessness that his father and me have displayed because of our fearlessness. You can't call my son your little broke best friend because he just might have more money than you in his investment. Come on. It's like you cannot, you know, see my son going through certain experiences that we experienced growing up because we have broken the cycle. And yes, when you are the ones that God has called, has chosen to break this generational poverty, generational mediocrity, and all these things that's been on your bloodline for years, you will get attacked. You will go through things. It will be stuff that bothers you. It will be times that you just like, dang, God, why have you called me? But you have to fight. You have to fight with the weapon, which is the word of God. You have to fight back with doing things, making them a part of your lifestyle, like praying and fasting. Like you cannot just be out here only fasting because your church is having a fast. And nothing is nothing wrong with doing a fast with the church. But some of y'all, if the pastor didn't say we was fasting, Y'all ain't fasting. Fasting is a lifestyle for me. I do not play. I need to hear what God is saying. I need to let him know that I'm humbling myself before him. And also, I want to be clear and let y'all know that I'm not just fasting like, let me fast because I want to get a bag real quick. You know, I'm also fasting because I just want to show God, like, listen, I, this is how serious I am about you. This is yeah. how much I want to let you know that I'm not about to play about my father. So I'm not always fasting in expectation of I need a million dollars tomorrow. I need this. It's like sometimes I might be fasting for somebody else. I don't know, but I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to do it and I'm going to do it consistently and make it be a part of my lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I love that because it sounds like fasting is a discipline and not simply something that you use out of desperation which yep. is exactly what it needs to be. It's mm -hmm. a discipline in a way that we continue to exercise our faith to make sure that we're constantly able to hear from God. I have enjoyed this so, so much. Thank Raven, you. thank you so much. Can you tell the people where they can connect with you and follow you and all of the things? Um, because I know, child, that they <laughs> blessed. I was blessed. Okay, I love yes, it. Yes, this has been so good. Thank you so much for having me. Um, my main page with all my ministry stuff is supernaturally paid on Instagram. So make sure that y'all go and um check me out on there. Um, that has all the links. My website is godpaysme.info. That's gonna link you to the podcast that you want you can listen to, also some free resources. Um, that I have available for Christians, like pretty much every single thing that you need is there. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to connect with y'all. If you enjoyed this podcast, make sure that y'all rate the podcast and show Dr. Charla some love because baby, y'all got to rate it. Don't be just DMing us like, oh my God, that really blessed me. Come on. Tell me with the stars. Okay. Come on. Give, give my sis podcast the five stars and make sure that you leave your review because we need other people to hear messages like this. You know, yeah. podcasts are so flooded with people practicing new age things and yeah. all kind of stuff. Like we need to bring the truth to the forefront. So do not X out of this without rating it and leaving my sis a comment. Girl, I love you. Come on, Raven. <laughs> Pull up. All right, y'all. That is it for this week's episode. I pray that y'all really enjoyed it and continue to love God, love people and love yourselves. And I will talk to y'all later. This episode of the Prescription for Purpose podcast is brought to you by The Society. The Society is our online membership community for women who want to grow in both their faith and in their business. It's hosted by myself, Tatum Tamia of the Blessed and Bossed Up podcast, Kavaya Watrice of the She Who Is Called app, and Rosalind Renee of the Therapy as a Christian podcast. This membership community literally has everything that you need. We do free challenges once a quarter. And our last challenge at the end of the year, people were getting saved. People were getting jobs, growing in their faith. I mean, it is just such a rich place to 
B. I absolutely love hosting the society because I get to teach Bible study every two weeks. Kavaya writes daily devotionals. We have prayer call every week. Tatum does business training and Rosalind makes sure that we are on our toes mentally and we're able to effectively be productive in every aspect of our life. I promise that you will not regret taking advantage of being a part of this community. Head on over to the blessed and bossed up society.com to start your free two week trial. That's blessed and bossed up society.com to start your two week free trial today. Now let's get back to the show. 